And everybody gets so quiet when that message comes up that we're live. <laughs> yeah. Watch our P's and Q's, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> we try to. <laughs> Easier said than done, I'll admit. No, no more cussing now. Yeah. <laughs> John, you're the arbitrator tonight. You're, you've got to set the example for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost too bad that we don't have Arlo Shapley and um, uh, Charles Federer here to talk about their founding of the Astronomical League so long ago. I don't know if there's any recordings at all, any place, even little clips or anything along the way. There may be there. I doubt it, but there may be. Probably not. That would be a good thing for the league, as we were kind of talking in our meeting yesterday. Things that you know could be added as we find historical data that we our videos or whatever uh, that we could add um, to our file. <clears throat> yeah. Well, uh, there's a few of them I I never want added. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe that's where some other those. Are that aren't supposed to be seen. <laughs> well, that 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 my curiosity is, is aroused from what John just said. <laughs> you know, it is a possibility that at some university or some place where these folks spoke uh, in the archives in the yeah. safe, there's a real to real type recording. And, you know, maybe at some point, seriously, we could put out the word if you have anything that yeah. might not seem valuable to you. But if you were there for a specific meeting, a national meeting or something like that involving the AL, please let yeah. us know. <laughs> Are you fighting your cats, Molly? Yes. <laughs> 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 I noticed the cats were gone when you stepped away and when you came back the cats came back too <laughs> yeah they followed me hoping for more food <laughs> yep yeah. yeah. animals are like that uh, and now he's rubbing his face on my monitor <laughs> you have astronomically perfect cats <laughs> <laughs> no, wasn't that funny <laughs> I thought it was. Oh, it was in the pun range, you know, for sure. <clears throat> Scotty has reset his watch. Yep. According to Scotty, we still have three minutes to go. You started a little early on Tuesday, which was a little surprising. We were all ready, but... Um, I kind of jumped the gun. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. We were all set anyway. <clears throat> it does good to change things around a little bit every once in a while. I, th I think so. I think really everybody's on their toes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> As Oh, sorry, I thought I hit the mute button. <laughs> Y'all are hearing me type away on my keyboard as I hurriedly put some more slides together. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Gave us something to listen to besides us. <laughs> and someone who knows how to type especially. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I've been. Uh, yeah, I was going to say that one finger. I didn't see that one finger typing. <laughs> oh no, not yeah. not here. Uh, I want to point out real quick. This is the posture he uh, assumes when he's like wanting additional food. He stands up, real tall and kind of 
points his head kind of toward the sky like he's all <laughs> regal and like uh-huh. I'm waiting for my food. <laughs> <laughs> we type by the biblical system. Seek and ye shall find. <laughs> I got to tell that one to my dad. <laughs> Looking toward the sky might be a sign that uh, he's going to be an astronomer someday. A master kid. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you going to do are you going to do astronomy Mr. Mr. Kitty? <laughs> oh, he just said yes and now he's rubbing me. So. <laughs> yeah, I just fed you. Go away. <laughs> or like lay down or something, please. <laughs> You always have a oh, way when you're I'm really, really busy. At my dad. It's a beautiful animal. I he's really my, he's my bestest him. boy, and he just seemed, I don't want him to go away. I just want him to lay down or, you know, <laughs> go get occupied on, on, you know, I don't know, clean clean yourself. On, on, you do that 10,000 <laughs> times a day. Why, why don't you work on that for a minute? <laughs> oh, he, he's giving me a very judgmental look, look right now. <laughs> do you see this face? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He also knows when he's on camera and he looks away. <laughs> My dog hates to have his picture taken. taken. <laughs> My cats, they know. They even they I, I have my phone in my hands all the time. They know when I'm trying to take pictures and they stop doing whatever cute thing they were doing. Yeah. <clears throat> Humans have always wanted to learn about the sun, but it's dangerous to stare at it with just our eyes, so we built structures to help us study it. Aristotle had his camera obscura. Galileo used a telescope to document sunspots. Spectrometers came next, allowing us to study the spectrum of the sun. 100 years later, George Ellery Hale explored the magnetic nature of the sun with a spectroheliograph. Next, we launched Skylab, and it gave us our first high-resolution pictures of the sun's surface. The Yoko spacecraft took x-rays of the sun. Then Soho and Hinode sent us even more incredible images. Trace delivered the closest ever pictures of the sun in its magnetic fields. SDO images the sun in many wavelengths. Now, with stereo, we see the whole sun in 3D, never missing an inch. Who knows what we will see next? We will just have to keep looking up. Well, hello everyone. This is Scott Roberts from the Explore Alliance, and it is my pleasure to uh, uh, kick off the uh, Astronomical League Live number 14, I think is what it is, Um, uh, featuring John Goss. Uh, He's got a great uh, uh, presentation for you tonight, um, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. Tonight, we've got uh, Terry Mann, who is the host of uh, the Astronomical League live programs. Uh, she puts on all these programs and has done a fantastic job. Uh, joining her is uh, David Levy, Molly Wakeling, of course, John Goss, our featured speaker, and Carol Orge. So I'm going to turn it over to you, um, Terry. Thank you very much, Scott. It's good to see everybody oh, again. I, I missed I missed one. Maynard. You missed Maynard. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> yes. that's right. Or Pittendre. I'm sorry. Yeah. So that's okay. I'm the one with the hard name. It's easier <laughs> to skip through me. Don't worry. I should about it. forget that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it's Maynard. <laughs> Maynard. That's right. That's right. Yes. So it is good to see everybody. We didn't have an AL live last month. And so it's good to get everybody back and see what's going on everywhere. So I would like to welcome everybody that's here and thank everyone that's also joining us to present tonight. So I would like to start with David Levy. And David, it is so good to see you and you make sure you tell Wendy hi. I know she can hear me in the background. Uh, It's so good to have you here. I know you both have been so busy. So thank you very much for joining us again. 
Well, thank you, Terry. And Wendy has heard every word you said, and she's waving at you right now. <clears throat> 92 years ago today, at this very moment, a young Clyde Tombaugh was sitting in the office of the director of the Lowell Observatory, V.M. Slifer. And he had just walked, waltzed into his office without knocking, sat down, and he had just said, Dr. Slifer, I have found your planet X. So at this very moment, 92 years ago, Slifer is rising out of his chair like he's sitting on a spring. <clears throat> and the story of Pluto post-discovery begins at that point. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for my welcome quotation tonight, I'm going to quote from my own biography of Clyde Tombaugh. And uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit, of course, when he discovered Pluto and uh, the others suggested that he, they keep it quiet, he keep it quiet for a while. So what Clyde did as a young person would do is he walked down through the snow and saw a movie. It was Gary Cooper in The Virginian. <clears throat> and uh, at the end of the movie, when they had the gunfight, he said Clyde practically jumped out of his chair, partly in shock at the gunfight, but partly because he didn't know how long he could keep it a secret about what he had just found. On March the 13th, 1930, the discovery was announced and it probably was about the best news of the year, considering the Great Depression had just begun a few months earlier. So what happened to Clyde? <clears throat> he continued observing with the 13 inch and uh, discovered a lot of other things, including a uh, variable star that, uh, that I'm still observing every chance I get called TV Corvi or as we nicknamed it, Tombaugh Star. <clears throat> but what was the award that he got for discovering of Pluto? About 15 minutes, years, not minutes, 15 years after the discovery, Clyde was fired from Lowell. Uh, the director said that, well, we don't have the funds and blah, blah, blah. But it bothered Clyde to the rest of his life. And I remember visiting with him. And as he grew older and older, he would talk to me about it and how it deeply had hurt him that he had left Lowell Observatory. <clears throat> the ending of the chapter of the book where he leaves Lowell goes like this. It does, is not about him, but about the telescope. The telescope Tombaugh was finally about to leave remained at Lowell. It's not a long career, not nearly over. Years later, director Arthur Hoag claimed that with its, with its many projects, the 13 inch had become one of the world's most productive telescopes. If it had consciousness, it might have wondered what would happen without the man it had shared a life with. A man who had never quite given up searching just one more pair of plates for hidden treasure. A man who called himself a traveler going over the next hill with an eternal hope. And with that, I give it back to you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, David. You know, I visited Lowell once and did the tour and was able to see that telescope. You know, it's, it's really amazing. You feel like it is just so historic mm. there. Everything is just so amazing. It's such a beautiful place. So hopefully everybody will be able to go out and see that this summer. I know they were closed for a little while, but I think I read where Lowell is open again, at least partially or for you know, uh, a certain amount of people to visit Lowell, I think, at this time. So thank you very much, David. I appreciate it. It's always so good to see you. Thank you. It's my honor. All right. With that, how about if we go ahead and go to Carol Orge, uh, president of the league, and you can give us an update. We had a very long meeting yesterday. So, Carol, I'm yes, going we did. We kept everybody with us to almost to the end, so that was good. Uh, yeah. David, it is so great to hear from you. And I didn't know that this was the anniversary of that meeting in uh, the, uh, at the Lowell Observatory. And uh, what a fascinating uh, 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 rendition of that story. I, I enjoyed that very much. So, 
Uh, we're about at the point, as Terry said, we didn't have a an uh, astronomical like live last month. So we've got some deadlines about to happen here. Uh, let's see if I can do that. How's that, how's that Scott, a little bit better? Okay. All right. <laughs> That's better. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Uh, so I thought tonight we would review some of the deadlines for the various awards that are coming up. So if I can share the screen here, Terry. Let's see. Well, I don't think this is going to work. Uh, let's see if I've got it here. Thought I had it all geared up. Let's, let's try once more. Here we go. All right. And we just see uh, panels as navigation yeah. and two very small thumbnails. I, of that. I'm, I recommend that you share your whole screen because sharing individual apps can be problematic. Are we good now? No, we're, we're seeing a very distorted image of, of Word uh, okay, let's go back here. All right. Um, you'll need to stop sharing your screen and then reshare there. to share your whole screen. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right. All right. Now we share it again. And we will get on here. Sorry about that. And now we are. Are we there now? Nope. Um, you haven't hit share yet. Okay. We're getting there. Sorry about this. That's all right. Okay. Well, this is really great, Carl. So now you're giving us something to tease you about later on. Yeah. <laughs> Don't push your luck now, John. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And then make that Word document or, yeah, there you go. Okay. All right. Now let's. Uh, okay. I'm an amateur at this as well as astronomy. So that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here we go, I believe. Maybe if you. Uh, start the slideshow from the beginning, you'll get a full screen without the navigation thing. So. Um, yeah, it will hopefully take a second. Okay. Here. Yeah. There you go. Are we good now? All right. Yeah. Okay, and let me do one more thing. Okay. Perfect. I don't want to be there, let's go. All right. Uh, I'd like to give a report of what's coming up. Uh, just within the last few days, we have confirmed that there, yes, there will be an Alcon 2022. The dates are July 28th through the 30th at the Embassy Suites in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. There is the uh, uh, link. Uh, it says there that the website will be available by January the 14th. However, there has been a delay and it looks like it will be about the end of February before that is available. But uh, it's coming up. Uh, there have been a few issues on the website, but it will be coming up. Okay. Uh, many of our league awards are coming up within the next six weeks. So I thought we'd go over those and just remind everybody uh, of these Astronomical League Awards starting with the Youth Awards. And the first one, uh, one of our premier awards for youth is the National Young Astronomer Award, generously supported by Scott Roberts and Explore Scientific. And Scott's been with us for, I don't know how many years, a long time ago, even in the mid days. And we are so appreciative of all the support you've given over the years. And it's just uh -huh. amazing and incredible the kind of quality we get from uh, the uh, high school age children, uh, it uh, ranks up there with professionals in many ways. They do the research and they really, uh, and I know we keep hearing that education is dead in the United States of America. Not true. We get some very good uh, applications each year. Uh, 
I don't know whether you can read the specific uh, uh, address there. If not, go to astrolabe.org and look under awards and it gives all the information. Each uh, application has a form that needs to be filled out to submit it to the, uh, uh, the judges. The other youth awards we have are the Horkheimer Youth Awards. And those include the Horkheimer Smith, the Horkheimer D'Aria, and the Horkheimer Parker Youth Imaging Award, as well as the Horkheimer O'Mara Youth Journalism Award. And those are continued to be uh, sponsored by the Horkheimer Charitable Trust. Uh, Jack Horkheimer, which most of you probably have heard of before, uh, uh, passed uh, about five years ago, and all of the awards have been uh, uh, continued on. And it's interesting to look at the names of those awards because uh, people who had been significant in Jack's life is how he named his awards. The first one being Horkheimer Smith. Uh, Smith was the founder of the Astronomical League, one of the first presidents. And the, Ar the ARIA Award is... Uh, uh, he was the founder of the Winter Star Party in Florida. So that's how he uh, made that uh, award there, the, the name of the award. And Don Parker, who many know as the Alpo person and uh, uh, the uh, planetary scientist, he was uh, uh, given the name for the Youth Imaging Award. And also uh, the O'Mara Award is the Youth Journalism Award. And I might back up a little bit and say each one of these awards have cash awards that go along with them. Uh, they're fairly significant. And also uh, the plaques and the uh, Smith Award, uh, the Smith winner gets a expenses paid trip to Alcon each year. This year it'll be in Albuquerque. Backing up to uh, the National Young Astronomer Award for just a second. Uh, Scott has most generously, uh, as I said, supported that program for many, many years. And uh, as part of the award, that person, that young person gets a complimentary uh, trip to Alcon as well. And a, a wonderful telescope from Scott as well. So it's much appreciated. And then we go to the, uh, the uh, uh, adult awards from the league. The first one is the sketching award. We uh, best way to find this one is to go on the league website and look under sketching award. Uh, it is no longer sponsored by Astronomic. We are still looking for a sponsor, uh, but that has the information there, has all the information on the website in order to uh, uh, get that information. There's a cash award along with that as well. And we have some very nice sketching each year. It's amazing when we set up this award a few years ago, because at that point, sketching had become almost a lost art. Now we have a, a, a program, uh, one of the Observing Award coordinators, uh, uh, Observing Award programs that actually is based on sketching. And it's amazing what can be found and what observed if you take the time to sketch what's going on. You bring a lot more out. So that's one of our awards that we usually get several awards, but we can all, or several entrants, but we can always use more. The next adult award is the Mabel Stearns Newsletter Award. And this doesn't have a formal application, but the president uh, and other officer of the uh, individual clubs can write a letter uh, recommending the newsletter editor of their club for that award. And that is such an important uh, award because that person in each club is the one who really communicates with the club uh, members and keeps it keeps it going, so that's very important. And finally, uh, one of our newest awards, the Wilhelmina Fleming Award, Image Award for Women, that just came online last year. We had some uh, significant numbers of applications. And this year, the other awards we've been talking about tonight are due on the 31st of March. However, this one we have extended to the same deadline we had for its initial year last year, and that is May 31st. So go to that uh, website there, uh, that link, and uh, uh, that's the way you uh, submit your application. And that is also sponsored by Explore Scientific. Thanks, Scott, for really bringing that award alive, and we look forward to really expanding that award 
uh, because it's uh, it's about time we're recognizing uh, all amateurs, uh, including uh, the ladies uh, who uh, do just as good, if not better work than we men. So we need to recognize them. And if you have any questions about that, email vice president at astroleague.org, vice president at astroleague.org. And Chuck Allen, our vice president, will get back with you with any questions you might have about the various awards. And now, Terry, back to you. Thank you, Carol. So, right. Molly, are you handy there? There she is. Molly, Molly and I are going to talk a little bit about the Fleming Award. And Molly, I'm going to let you uh, go ahead and start off after you get done eating. <laughs> Yeah, I was having myself a little snack. I didn't get dinner tonight. So. Yeah. <laughs> I figured the cat talked you into eating, right? <laughs> well, she's going to say the cat had uh, taken some of the dinner. Yeah, yeah that's um, true. He may very well come and steal a chip or two, but I've managed to distract him with some dry food, I think, maybe. So, <laughs> or at least right. uh, he's, he's gotten tired of trying to ask me for food. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they eventually give up. So, all right, Molly, you can take it away. All right. Um, so uh, I thought I would, uh, since, since I won the award last year, the first year that it existed, that I'd come on and, and talk a little bit about uh, the award, as well as Wilhelmina Fleming and her legacy. Um, so I'm going to um, share my slides here. I think they're going to end up on the screen, probably. When I hit share, let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, the uh, uh, I'm really excited that the Wilhelmina Fleming Imaging Award exists. I think, uh, as we all know, there's not a whole lot of women who are in astronomy, and there's even fewer who do astrophotography. That's kind of reflective of women in STEM in general. Although I do find among STEM fields astronomy seems to have the highest percentage of women uh, than any other STEM field that I've interacted with. Um, so, uh, and I think that that's because of legacy of, of women who were in astronomy in the early days of it, uh, including Lamina Fleming. And uh, that's, there's, there's a lot of, uh, that's, that's the place, astronomy is also the place where I come across the most women who were in, in science in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, which was a, a very early time. So, um, yeah, it's uh, so glad that this award exists. And the I, I think it's really important to have awards like this to show that there's recognition for astrophotography and for women astrophotographers. And I will hopefully start to build up that community in a similar way that the sketching awards is kind of brought back to life sketching of astronomical objects. Um, so uh, the award was established uh, last year by the Astronomical League as part of their 75th anniversary recognition of women's contributions to astronomy, including, uh, actually it's up, it's up my, uh, the calendars, uh, uh, the Astronomical League calendar for this year is, is all about not just uh, the women astrophotographers whose images are featured in it, um, but also the contributions of women to astronomy. And I have that, that calendar at my work desk as opposed to my, my home desk, so I was going to show it. Um, so uh, I was very honored to, to win the, uh, this award, first place for this award the first year that it was offered. And uh, the plaque is enormous. I put my thumb in there to, <laughs> to show how enormous yeah. it was. <laughs> um, so I wanted to show some examples of, of images that, uh, not just my images, but I've got the, uh, um, the, the runners up as well to show the quality of, of the images as well as what other women astrophotographers can aspire to, to apply for this award. Um, so I think at, at some point later on, uh, Terry was gonna ask me more specifically about the images that I took. So I'll leave off the, uh, um, the specific details of these for the current moment. Uh, Lynn Peterson was the runner up and these are her gorgeous galactic images here, including some really incredible tidal stream detail in the, um, my mouse is on the screen, in the Sunflower Galaxy. Uh, the, the actually somewhat hard to capture hydrogen outflows from the Cigar Galaxy and uh, just incredible, beautiful color and detail in at the M106 Galaxy. 
And then of course, uh, we have we have Terry Mann with us tonight. And uh, she also had some incredible images here of the Northern Lights, the 2017 solar eclipse, and just some great shots from, from the Great Lakes. All right, so uh, let's talk about Wilhelmina Fleming. Now, in when I was doing research, I found in one place that apparently it was actually pronounced Williamina, but I haven't verified this fact. Uh, so I'm going to keep saying Williamina because I like it better. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, some verification is needed on the on the pronunciation of her name. I think. Oh, my cat's here to sniffing out my, my chips. So let me move those over here. Um, well, we'll see if he gets into those. All right. So she was born in 1857 in Scotland and married. Uh, he's either called a banker or an accountant or something along those lines. James Orr Fleming, at age 20. And uh, like many people in that era, they, a lot of people were coming to America and they sailed to Boston in 1878. And uh, at, at this time, her, and she, so she was only 21, her husband abandoned her and their unborn child when they arrived in Boston, and, um, which is very tragic, but ultimately led her to do the incredible things that she did with her life. She worked as a housemaid for Edward Pickering, name you might recognize of astronomical fame, who was then the director of the Harvard College Observatory. Now, um, you, there's various reasons how she moved from that housemaid job to working at the observatory. Uh, probably my, my favorite one, of which may or may not be true, but I want to believe it's true, was that uh, according to legend, uh, Pickering had become frustrated with the male assistants that he had at the observatory. Uh, who were doing a lot of the calculations and classifications and things like that, and declared that his maid could do a better job. <laughs> and <laughs> to follow up on his words, he hired her <laughs> in 1881. Um, another source I read said that uh, Pickering's wife noted that she had uh, talents, what the article said, talents beyond the maternal arts. <laughs> and uh, so recommended to her husband that she perhaps work at the at the Harvard College Observatory. So I got to do something a little more interesting than, than house cleaning. So while she was at the observatory, she led a team of women computers since uh, you know, there weren't machines doing a lot of this mathematical work yet. And while it may sound like, yeah, women doing math, it was actually uh, relegated to women as a women's job because of its drudgery <laughs> and how, how turning the crank wheel, doing, doing the mathematical tasks were. Uh, so uh, these women computers were uh, analyzing stellar spectra from the observatory telescopes. And these included names that have gone on to astronomical fame, including Annie Jump Cannon, Henrietta Swan Leavitt, and Antonia Mari. Some of these names you might recognize. Uh, and while she was doing that work, Wilhelmina Fleming devised a new system to classify stars based on their hydrogen content, which eventually evolved into the Hertzsprung Russell system that we use today, that I'm going to uh, talk about in a couple of slides here. The first edition of the Draper Catalog of Stellar Spectra had uh, many of her, she, she was one of the main driving force behind this catalog, had 28,266 of her spectra of 10,351 stars on 633 photographic plates. That sounds like an awful lot of work. <laughs> more work, more work than, than I would want to do. <laughs> um, she, also went on to, uh, she wrote, edited, and proofread research papers, annual reports, data tables, as well as the annals of the Astronomical Observatory of Harvard College. She actually published some of her own work and was one of the few women to attend research conferences at that time. She made a number of discoveries of novae and, and other objects, including the Horsehead Nebula, which is a favorite of astrophotographers and is observable visually as well with a large enough aperture, dark enough skies and a hydrogen beta filter. In 1899, she was promoted to curator of astronomical photographs, which made her the first woman to ever hold a Harvard college title. And in 1906, she became the first American as well as the first Scottish woman to be elected for honorary membership to the Royal Astronomical Society. Now she unfortunately died at the young age of, of 54 
while she was still shining bright with all these with all these discoveries due to pneumonia, which is very tragic. So uh, to, to talk about the system that she devised, um, so the Draper catalog of stellar spectra, um, Henry Draper wasn't actually responsible for any part of the catalog. It was, it was um, uh, this has actually happened after his passing and his wife who was wealthy from, from his wealth uh, was, was uh, funding the creation of a catalog of solar spectra. So that's how his name ended up on it. Uh, Fleming and, and Pickering developed a system of classification based on the hydrogen content of stars, which was one of the main products of stellar spectra. Uh, I guess I should say what, what spectra are. So when, um, so when with our eyes, we can see red, green, and blue light from across the whole visible spectrum. And what a, what, what spectroscopy does is you're looking at the you're breaking up that swath of stellar spectra into, into smaller, smaller segments and seeing what the intensity of, of those smaller segments of the spectrum are. It's as if you had uh, a thousand eyeballs, each one tuned to a specific segment of color, and you were looking at how bright the light looked for each of these different colors. And so stars, they have this particular emission spectra, so where there's elements that are in the star that are emitting light on a very particular wavelength due to some really cool physics. And there's also absorption spectra where there are, there's energies being absorbed in order for these electronic transitions to happen in the electrons of the atom. So uh, one of the prominent lines that's visible in a lot of the universe is hydrogen because there is so much hydrogen in the universe and it's the primary component of stars. So basing a system of classification on stars on their hydrogen content makes a lot of sense because as stars at different points in their lives are going to have more or less hydrogen content as well as different, uh, different types of stars. So the original system has 17 different classes based on the intensity of these hydrogen lines. Class A had the strongest absorption lines and class O had virtually no absorption lines that were visible. So on the, on the left is an example of, of uh, different types of stars and what their absorption spectra look like. Um, and I can't really read that text, but the, the top one is stars such as uh, Sirius, Vega, Altair, Regulus, which have very few absorption lines. Uh, and these are, these are really bright blue, o, what we now call O-type stars. The second one there being stars like the Sun, Pollux, Arcturus, Procyon, stars that are more main sequence, and they have a whole lot of lines strewn throughout the whole spectra. Um, and th there's a, it goes on from there. So this eventually led to the modern classification system the, the system that Fleming and Pickering had come up with was modified by Annie Jump Cannon and Antonia Mari, and it was the precursor to the system that we use today. So uh, they rearranged, the, they dropped a lot of letters and rearranged some of them so that O-type is the, is, it's, still, it's still related to the hydrogen lines, but now with a better understanding of the physics of that star. So O-type is the hottest and thus the bluest type of star, and M is the coolest type. And we've now gone on to add two more letters, L and T, for these very dim red dwarfs and brown dwarfs that are detectable now that weren't detectable back then. And then there's subgroups among those, uh, those spectral types, as we call them. And so if you look at the spectral types there uh, in, in the chart on the right, you can see there, there's kind of a, an odd order to the letters, they're not alphabetical. So a, a mnemonic that we were taught back in, in undergrad to memorize the spectral type was uh, oh, be a fine guy or gal, kiss me. <laughs> so that's how you can remember the, the order of the spectral types. Uh, and I guess you could add on LT to be like today or anything else you could think of. <laughs> so, uh, there's subdivisions among those spectral types, zero to nine being hottest, hottest to coldest. So just kind of subdividing those. And then their luminosity is designated by Roman numerals where one and one A are, or I and IA are supergiants and hypergiants. 
and then V are main sequence stars, and it actually goes up to VII down to uh, dwarf stars and, and such. So with this classification system, the sun is a type G2V star, which is a main sequence star that has a surface temperature of 5,800 Kelvin. So I've got a little chart down here showing how, so the temperature of the star correlates with the color of that star due to some cool physics. So uh, O-type stars are blue and they actually do appear blue, like Rigel, it looks more blue than Arcturus, for example, when you look at it visibly in the sky. So O-type is more blue, M-type down toward the red dwarfs is more red. So I bet you weren't making on a science lesson today, but there's your science lesson for the day. Uh, and a really cool shot of Wilhelmina Fleming superimposed on her discovery of, of the Horsehead Nebula. Um, she and other women early in astronomy really paved the way for women in the sciences in general, all the way up to me now being uh, uh, working on my PhD in, in nuclear physics and uh, want to continue to see more women in STEM and also more women involved in astrophotography. And the group is growing. I'm part of a group of, of women astrophotographers around the world known as Stella. And uh, we're trying to get more people into it and we teach each other new techniques and things like that. So. Uh, it's it's growing, and of course, the more women we have in it, the more people we have in it in general, and the more amazing astro images we'll get out of amateurs as a result. So that's what I've got. <laughs> right. Thank, right. thank you, Molly. While I have you online, what I would like to do is to present you with the Wilhelmina, or however you want to say it, <laughs> uh, imaging award pin that every woman that enters that competition will receive one of these pins, whether you win it or runner up, whatever you are, you will receive a pin just for entering. So I would like to present this to you, Molly. Uh, let me see if I, uh, there we go. Get it the right way. Let me, and there you go, Molly. Thank you. Oh, look, I have it. Oh. <laughs> it is magic. That's magic. some internet magic right there. <laughs> right. That's, That's right. incredible. Yeah. 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 You know, yep, it is. It's just incredible. So uh, I, a couple of things I do want to follow up on, as Carol mentioned, on this award, um, we are redesigning the website and it's running a little bit behind. So we will update the website um, probably with more information about all of the awards, especially the Wilhelmina. Probably I would say by the end of February, maybe beginning of March. And the big changes I think for this year in the award, there will be categories. There will be at least four categories and you will be judged in each category instead of an across the board. Like for our first year, uh, we had three winners. It was first, second, and third. And that was it. This year, we kind of, with Scott's help and Explore Scientific, we have created some categories and we're still ironing out a few of the details on that. But we should have that up, like I said, at the end of next month, early March. But a deadline has been extended till May 31st. So you have plenty of time, uh, even though we're running later on this and changing some of the rules a little bit, you'll have time to get your entries in and really look at what you want to enter. And I think that'll be the big changes this year for the Wilhelmina Award. And I, I'm also like Molly, it's great to see all these women coming out in astrophotography. It was really fun to get a group of us together that we can sit down and we sound as geeky as everybody else. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we're talking filters, we're talking equipment, we're talking drives, you know, and it's great. It's really great because it's fun to see everybody has a different opinion, just like with everybody, what they want to work on, what they want to see, uh, the problems though that we run into a lot of the times, many of them are the same. So thank you very much, Molly. I appreciate it. And congratulations on winning first place. And from yeah. that, oh, it's me. Let's ask the three <laughs> questions that I'm going to ask. Uh, as you know, on every astronomical um, league live show that we do, we give away three door prizes. And so I am going to bring this up. It takes my screen just a minute to go to the larger. As you can see, this time the winners will 
or the door prize will be a travel mug. So three winners will be drawn. Each one will win one Astronomical League travel mug. One of the things they wanted me to mention is we are having problems shipping international. It is taking forever uh, to get these things shipped. If, you if somebody from outside the US wins, we might run into some issues and we might need to contact you to see you know, what will help get the, pro the door prize through. So just to make you aware, if um, you win something and it doesn't show up for quite a while, please drop me an email or drop um, Carol or anybody else on the league, league website an email and tell us there's been a problem you have not seen your door prize. So please send your answers in the next 30 minutes. Uh, in case you watch the GSP, this is kind of not like the GSP, we award the three prizes tonight. So we need your answers in as quick as you can get them in. The winners will be announced after the last speaker, which will be John Goss, and someone from the Astronomical League will contact all winners to get a shipping address. Okay, and I'm gonna go to questions for tonight. Please remember to send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. And again, uh, the last GSP we had, I did get some emails saying that the emails were uh, bouncing back from this address. If that happens, um, uh, look at the league website, drop Carol, try to drop somebody else an email uh, to let us know that. One of the people that answered the questions had other email, some other emails of mine and contacted me and let me know. Right now, it does not look like there's any problem at all. But in case it bounced back, be patient. Uh, I will accept the answers clear up until not, yeah, this it would be this Sunday because we'll, GSP will be on Tuesday. So set, keep trying to send it if it does not go through, but right now we are not having a problem. Now, with speaking about the Fleming Award, the first question is Fleming's work at the Harvard Observatory was so outstanding that Pickering put her in charge of hiring and supervising a team of women to sort and study the immense collection of photographs of star spectra. Over the next 15 years, how many women did Fleming hire? And please, again, send your answers to secretary at astroleague.org. Next question. You're gonna hear about this from John Goss. No man ever steps into the same river twice. This statement is an, a, an, al, blah, an analogy saying what? What are they trying to say with that statement? What are they referring to? And again, send your answers to Astro, uh, secretary at astroleague.org. All right, my fingers are crossed. We're gonna see a nice comet at the end of April and maybe the beginning of May. What is the name of that comet? And again, secretary at astroleague.org. And we repeat this over and over just so you know, because we've gotten comments, we go through these so fast that people don't have the time to read this and understand the quest. And they'd like to have a few minutes to, or a couple minutes to look at it. So that's what we are doing. And for now, that is the end of the questions. Um, questions this time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stop my share. All right. Maynard, how about if we let you talk and maybe you haven't seen a whole lot of Maynard Pittendre. Maynard Pittendre is the exec secretary of the Astronomical League. He is also uh, the observe, one of the observing program directors. So Maynard, how about if I turn this over to you? Well, thank you, Terry. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time to be here tonight. Uh, uh, I want to talk about a particular program in our uh, Astronomical League. John Goss always comes up with the best ideas. And he came up with this. No, don't shake your head. No, John, you know you did this. He comes came up with this idea and he presented it to a group called the National Observing Program Coordinators, which is a long title, but it's a group of uh, five of us who are charged with supervising all of the uh, observing programs and observing challenges and 
Uh, anytime anybody proposes a new observing program, like John did a few months ago, it has to go through our group. And John's idea was to create an observing challenge uh, that would offer something of interest to amateur astronomers with a small telescope, as well as I think the more advanced uh, astronomers will enjoy it as well. Uh, I will, I'm looking forward to it because I've got a, a new small aperture telescope and I wanna see what uh, this new smaller telescope can do. Now, John's idea was that galaxy season is, is coming up in spring and uh, this is when we have a, a, an opportunity to observe some special galaxies. And he was thinking that uh, of a challenge that would just uh, take uh, a few months and not a whole year or several years, uh, but just a few months and would um, be observable in uh, what he called a small telescope, such as an eight inch reflector. I got to tell you that that hurt me because when I was a teenager and got a uh, a cave optical eight inch telescope. I thought I had the biggest telescope imaginable, <laughs> but that was pre dob mount and the mount themselves were about a hundred pounds. Um, nobody in the, our group of uh, coordinators um, really debated whether or not this was a good idea or not. We just started on the band wagon about listing possible targets uh, for this program. Now, let me point out, uh, we had a question in chat a few minutes ago about what's the difference between the awards that Carol was talking about and the other observing programs. An observing challenge is its own category as well. And uh, an observing challenge is open to anyone, not simply members of the Astronomical League. So if you're interested in this, uh, I think, uh, you know, this is something uh, that you'll enjoy. I'm going to share a screen now and talk a little bit about um, the, uh, uh, this program. When spring comes, the love of galaxies is in the air. <laughs> well, uh, the observing challenge. Um, it starts March 1. Can't start working on it now. And if you've observed any of these galaxies, they don't count yet. So this, it starts March 1. It ends June 30th, short time frame. And the deadline for submissions is July 31st, 2022. Now I've got the, uh, the web page uh, address and it's going to stay on this uh, uh, screen showing the, um, uh, the web page for how to find uh, this particular, um, the instructions for this. I've also just now put it in the chat uh, that we've got. Well, one comment I'll make, uh, the Astronomic League 50th anniversary, we're in the 75th anniversary. Am I that far behind? No, this is the 50th anniversary of the observing programs uh, that's commemorated by that. Now, I've lost my place here, unfortunately. Um, well, y'all are getting previews of everything. Let me uh, stop the share for a moment. And uh, how do I stop the share? Uh, you can use the scroll wheel to scroll back up or the arrow keys on your keyboard. Okay. All right, thanks. Somebody got me out of that mess. Yeah, I was going to avoid a, a problem that one of my colleagues had earlier. Now I've gotten right into it. So, um, if you use the the left arrow key on your keyboard, you can back up. All right, there we go. There we go. Thank you very much. I was I was pushing the volume button. <clears throat> you know, when you get to my age, you know, I really ought to use these things better. Uh, galaxies, you know, are are available throughout the year, but April through June, that's a prime time to observe uh, some of these galaxies. And um, all of these galaxies on this list own a couple, just a couple of uh, 
constellation. They're rising in the east in the evening, and it's just a great time to, to go out and observe some of the wonderful targets. Now, the question is, where should I begin my trek through the galaxies? And if you're new to observing galaxies, uh, this particular observing challenge is for you. Now, the challenge is designed to be available to people in the northern as well as the southern hemisphere. And we have met John's goal, I think, in that all galaxies should be available uh, to be seen through an eight-inch telescope. I kind of think that it, it, they might be um, visible uh, with a, you know, if you got better eyes than I've got. <laughs> <laughs> I think they might be observable in some of the smaller uh, aperture telescopes as well. Now, your challenge, if you accept it, is to observe at least 12 of the galaxies on the object list. And the object list has a lot of choices for you. And as I say, the objects have to be observed on or after April 1st and no later than uh, um, the end of June. Now, go-to telescopes are allowed, and remote telescopes are allowed. And uh, you can do this by uh, visually, or you can do imaging work, either way. So there's, you know, it's, um, it's got a lot of uh, openness about uh, the rules for this uh, observing challenge. Our purpose is to get you to start, especially the uh, the newer amateurs to get them to enjoy observing galaxies. Now, this is what your, sub, your submission needs to include. And don't write all this down. All of this is on the web page uh, that I, I've shared in the chat and they're on all of the other screens. Didn't have room for it on this screen. But you want to identify the number, you put the date and time of your observation, scene and transparency. Um, and because I cut and pasted it, it says, for more information, check out the definitions located here. <laughs> well, you can't click that uh, link. But if you were on the web page and you saw this list, you could uh, click that link and it would take you to how to define seeing and transparency. Uh, your location and the instrument you used and a brief description and a sketch. Uh, if you don't do imaging, a sketch is good. And um, I think it was Carol who was mentioning that sketching had become a lost art for a while. And I'm glad to see that it's coming back. Now, the purpose of the sketch is that it really forces you to think about what is it that you're seeing. And so often when we take an image, we don't really scrutinize all the, the, the different details of these objects. There's a great value in sketching. Um, when you make your submission, you tell us who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Give us your address, your club affiliation, your phone number, all that, and the name and email of where you want the award set. And Cliff, uh, whose information is here, and it's on the web page uh, for this observing program, he is the coordinator for this particular program, and he can answer all of your questions, and, um, and he will review your submission, and I am sure that... Uh, uh, he will be more than happy to um, um, send you an award, receive your submission, and uh, to uh, answer any questions that you may have. And, um, you know, I, I, I really meant it, John, when I said you come up with some of the best ideas. You really do. And uh, don't groan like that. You know, take this compliment like a man. <laughs> you know, uh, and any of you who have uh, proposals, uh, not every uh, proposal gets approved, but a lot of them do. And, um, you know, if you've got a proposal, be like John, uh, present it to the National Coordinators Program uh, group, and uh, we'll be glad to take a look at it. But, you know, this is right around the corner, and uh, this will be a good way to to uh, spend some of your evenings in the spring. The first program that I did was Meje Objects. And the way I started that, I'd been an observer already for 25 years at, at that point. And um, I realized I was going outside and looking at the same objects every night. And um, 
I got to thinking, I'm not sure I've seen all the Meijer objects. And I looked through my observing notes and sure enough, I hadn't. So I spent about a year uh, observing the, the Meijer objects, keeping careful notes of star hopping and things like that. And um, all of the observing programs, for me, one of the values is it teaches me things outside my box. But it also gives me um, some things to look at, some of which I've never seen before. And, and I've been at this for, well, I'm 67, so I started when I was nine. I can't do mathematics, but you know, you can figure it out. <laughs> but this is a great program. I think you're gonna enjoy it. And uh, so I highly recommend it. Any questions that anybody has, or has any question come over the chat uh, while I've been talking? Actually, Maynard, I do, do have something very, very quick that I found out yeah. today. I think on the website, it says that the start date is April 1st, but it really is March 1st. So Okay, it's March 1st. We'll have to get that, get and that I think, changed. I think my slideshow said that because, yeah. Uh, it did. Yeah, because it did. I was pulling those numbers. But that's something I should have known, John. But um, my eyesight's going bad. I can't do math. And I can't remember anything. So what were we talking about again? <laughs> okay, thanks, John, for clarifying this. This is coming sooner than you expected. So get right on it. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Uh, somebody was um, asking if I could post the uh, link to the challenge. I'm doing that right now. Okay. okay, great. There you go. Okay. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, I didn't think our chat got through to everybody, but I knew that Scott could take care of everybody. Somebody, somebody hands it over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Maynard. Enjoy and, that. And this will be in the reflector, I think. So there'll be more and more uh, visible information about it, but plan on it now. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Sure. Scott, how about if we take about a 10 minute break and we will come back with John Goss. Okay, we'll do that. All right, thank you. Thank you.
Hey, Molly. Molly. Yeah. That was a great exchange of pins there on the screen with that, with that new uh, Zoom feature I read about. Yeah, yeah. It's the new uh, Zoom teleportation. Yeah, feature. the, the, the teleportation cool. feature. I, it, it comes in handy like that. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you, you guys did that perfectly. <laughs> we, we did have a little bit of practice. <laughs> oh, I, I think, yeah, yeah, hold it up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the problem is that if you try to stick your hand through the Zoom uh, feature and a fly is going in with you, it, yeah. it causes all sorts of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you get you get some paradoxes, you get some some transporter uh <laughs> like uh it let's see, I'm trying to think of a good Star Trek techno jumble for this transporter <laughs> malformation or something. Yeah, that, that's probably <laughs> A transporter malformation. Yeah. <laughs> you now have people wanting me to deliver telescopes this way. So. <laughs> and <it was> <laughs> yeah. hey, Maybe I, I saw it on AL Live. Cool. Must be true. Of yeah, course. I'm still, I'm on, uh, still waiting on my, I've ordered a Celestron 9.25 inch edge back mm -hmm. in September, and they haven't reached any of the vendors yet. They're still in China somewhere. So <laughs> keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, no. Well, um, it looks like we're back, uh, and um, now uh, you're, you're muted. muted. You were there a second ago. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I believe in you, Scott. <laughs> Are we Master, one Esther streamer? Nope, still don't have you. <laughs> uh, maybe check check your, uh, your the microphone source in uh, um, in the microphone settings. Make sure you got the right one selected. How about this? There you, you go. There you, you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> For some reason, I, that knocked me out into mute. So. Uh, but uh, we're back after our, our uh, 10 minute break or 10 minute and some seconds break. And uh, uh, Terry, it's, I'm handing it back over to you. Okay, Scott. I thought you had a video here you were going to play, or maybe you weren't. Maybe I'm mistaken. Like a cool transition kind of thing? Yeah, like you said, John would really like it. Oh, yeah. The, all we the... played that at the beginning. Oh, we, we didn't did. see it. I didn't see it. You didn't watch it. I could play it again if you like. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty cool. Or yeah, not, 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 the video, not the whole solar video. Not the whole solar video, but like, like the it, transition yeah. uh, with the cool logo. Oh, the yeah, transition. Now that we're talking about it, I, I saw that. Curious. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> we got to see it. Well, now. we will show this. Okay, so I can do this one. Here we are. Let me. Um... I call this uh, John Goss on fire. Is what I call oh, it. No. <laughs> this one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, literally him. That's great. <laughs> that's dubious. Don't draw the logo. That's cool. <laughs> so, so for everybody that I've told, this is very relaxed, and we have a lot of fun. You can see we actually do. So, all right, John. After you cool off, you can start speaking if you like. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. Uh, well, let me um, let me start out by explaining what a lot of this is about. In um, November, the league celebrated its 75th anniversary, and we had an astronomical league live in honor of that. Um, and we each gave a little talk about it. Well, what I'd like to say tonight is kind of a part two of what I led in last time. So it's kind of a continuation of um, something a little bit different too, I, I, I hope. And I'm just looking at the people in front of me on the screen from Scott and Molly and Terry and Carol and Maynard, who's checked out. I don't know where he went, but uh, this may all have something for each of you in here. Um, you'll see. So let me start. And I'll, of course, I'll be apologizing all the way through this, but let's uh, see what I can do. Uh, Okay, good, thank you. 
So I hope everybody can see my initial screen there. Yeah. Um, all is change. That's the, um, whole, the whole point of this, of, of the league been in, being in existence for 75 years, all the change, all is change. It's my own personal view of, of how astronomy has gone about. And you'll see, I gave some uh, strange sounding names from impressionism to postmodernism, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But first, I'd like to get the league off the hook uh, that all these views are my own. Uh, and I have obtained these views from my many years of talking to different people about amateur astronomy and my own personal experiences. So um, all the controversial views I will present here are my own. There's nothing controversial. So we have all this change. Um, there have been a lot of variations of, of this saying over the years. Uh, the other famous one is no man ever steps in the same river twice. But uh, there's some other variations of this, that the only constant is change and nothing endures but change. So I, I wanna emphasize uh, the change that we have experienced over the past 30, 40, 50 years and then into the future. Now, I came across another quote by Charles Darwin, which of course has nothing to do with the astronomical league, but it kind of does. Um, it's not the strongest of the species that survive nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. So that's kind of speaks to the astronomical league that for it to continue on in amateur astronomy and being what it is, it has to change with the times. And we know that, uh, it, that's, that's not an issue here, but uh, it's something always to keep, keep in mind. So I, I got a little chart here. I'd like to explain uh, a little bit about it right now. Um, I broke, um, I was looking at the history of amateur astronomy and I broke it up into different sections. Of course, I had to get names of these sections, so I chose names in art history. Um, some of these you may recognize, the minimalism, impressionism, modernism, postmodernism, and so on. And I'd like to start out talking about uh, the era of minimalism. And some of that's kind of obvious here, what, what we're talking about. Back in the 30s and 40s, amateur astronomy was more of a do-it-yourself hobby. There was a lot of amateur telescope making. But there were some commercial instruments available. Um, most of those were fairly small re refractors. And part of the reason why I put the disclaimer at the beginning about these are my own views, because I don't want to make it sound like I'm putting anybody down by any of this stuff. A two to three inch refractor is what they had back then, and they tried to do their very best of, 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 of what it was. So, as you well imagine what a two inch refractor or reflector or anything, two inches could do, it doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. Only the brightest objects are what you could see. But also think about um, the cost of some, some of this stuff, and why amateur telescope making was so um, uh, into it back then. Well, a small refractor back then, $110 to $130, something like that. Uh, of course, that was money then. So uh, what does that mean uh, for comparison purposes? Well, Ford Model T, which have, uh, is a pretty substantial object, was roughly twice the amount of what a, a, a small refractor would, would, would cost. So you can imagine that, hey, not too many people actually bought these things. So some people did. Oops, oops. Sorry. There we go, 1940s. Now, I, I like, I just, I kind of poke around with, with this and because this is a, talking about this as a portable refractor. Well, as you all know, this is not a refractor. This is a reflector and it's pointed in the wrong way, which always gives a good laugh because we're so smart nowadays. Okay, let's move up to impressionism. My own uh, view of that. Um, impressionism was, was really uh, kind of at the at, at post-war, post-World World, Post World War II, um, there were a lot of, um, I call it impressionism because they were impressions of deep sky objects. Not really very good views, but it gave you a hint, an indication of, of what was really out there. Um, looking at some of the nebula, globular clusters and such, you could only see the brighter ones, but you didn't really get to see any real detail in them. Uh, telescopes at this time were again, were three to four inch refractors. Uh, some small reflector, reflectors were coming into being. Amateur telescope making again was still, still, still going on. 
Uh, if you look at the magazines, um, you know, especially Sky and Telescope magazine, you will see plenty of ads for um, telescope making supplies and equipment, such as these right here. Well, that was back in the 1950s. And I'm sure most of you, the older people here will remember Edmund Scientific that had just about everything you needed for amateur telescope making. Uh, and they did sell at that time small uh, telescopes as well. So this is what the amateur was really involved in in the age of impressionism. My, my first telescope was a four inch dinoscope reflector. And yes, I remember it really did cost forty nine ninety five because that was about uh, three months of my paper route salary to uh, pay for that baby. And I really liked it. I still have it, it's up in my attic now. Um, it, was a, it was a good introduction to amateur astronomy, but you couldn't really see a whole lot with it. Four, four inches, no, I don't know. You also might remember refractors, unitron. Now these are interesting. I, I like looking at these simply because of all the stuff they have on them. You know, this is still only like a three inch, perhaps a four inch refractor, but you got everything. You got camera mounts on it. You got counterweights at the front. You got counterweights on, on the um, equatorial mount. You have a, a, a finder scope. You have a, a guide scope. You have a wheeled eyepiece uh, that contains, what, what, and this has five different eyepieces you can, you can put in there. Uh, these, this is the era of the famous um, solar filter that fits on the eyepiece that uh, we, uh, we don't miss anymore for that. Uh, this has uh, probably some filters tossed in there. And of course, there's gotta be a borrow lens someplace. But this had a lot of stuff with a lot of gear and uh, a person my age back then would have really thought this was the coolest thing to have. How did we find stuff back in the age of Impressionism? Well, um, there, wasn't, there weren't too many uh, star charts, star atlases around, but this is probably the best one that you could get your hands on easily, printed by Sky Publishing at the time. And it would, it would show you about everything you're, you're gonna find. Now with a three inch or a four inch telescope, this shows you a whole lot more and it gets your hopes up only to be dashed by reality that you couldn't see half this stuff on there. Then comes the era of uh, modernism. Uh, just like in art history, we have modernism, we have an early stage and a late stage. Now the early stage would be more like for an, an, an era of, of uh, six inch re reflectors coming into being. Uh, the first steps of, um, of uh, schmidt cast coming into being. And the late portion of their modernism would be larger uh, dobsonian based reflectors. In this area, uh, the telescopes were large enough that you could actually see stuff, get, get some real detail. You could see uh, individual stars and globular clusters. You could see, um, oh, interesting stuff in, in a lot of nebula, Orion Nebula, M8, M17, M16, and all those. And, and some galaxies. And uh, um, you could see actually some, some detail of, of the closer, more uh, larger galaxies. So th this was an, an, an era which a lot of people got into the hobby um, and got, got something out of. It lasted what, for about 20 years, uh, no, about, about 30 years actually, until postmodernism came along. Well, no, let's, let's go back and talk about modernism still a little bit. Uh, dinoscope six inch dinoscope, you can start seeing some pretty good stuff with this. Uh, take some astrophotos, but I don't know, I don't know about those astrophotos. They, they were pretty hard to grab back then. But $200 would, would, would get you this. Uh, Celestron C8, the very first ad was I think 1972 in, in uh, Sky and Telescope. This was the first ad. And you know the C8 has gone through many changes, many improvements. Uh, but it's still eight inch and it, you can still see the same stuff in it. Now here's Maynard's favorite telescope. He, he liked cave optical. Uh, they had a, a number of very fine telescopes back then and they were uh, from my paper up salary. Uh, these were pretty pricey, but uh, it was something to want and that's what a lot of people got. And uh, people who have these telescopes still have them today, I'm sure, and they treasure them. Another one that I know that Maynard has, has is a Questar. 
Uh, this is sort of the, the jewel box of telescopes and that you can carry it around like a microscope and see stuff in the sky. Uh, again, it's not a very big aperture, but yeah, okay. It, it is pretty cool looking, pretty cool. Back then, how to use your telescope? Well, this kind of summed it all up. You know, you, you get this six inch um, telescope, you don't know how to use it. This is a pretty basic book and it told you everything you know on how to get going in amateur astronomy. Star atlases, again, back then, not all that great, not all that detailed, but there was one Norton's um, Star Atlas and that contained quite a few uh, um, objects that you're probably never gonna be able to find, but it was interesting. Um, we have, no, I can't get that. Okay, uh, the star atlas had very, very basic stuff in it. You could see some nebula and some star clusters, double stars and such. But that got you on the right track. The moon, well, moon maps weren't all, all, that, all that great back then. Um, of course, that's when exploration of the moon really began with the Apollo, Apollo missions. A lot of you probably have this particular item uh, from National Geographic, the moon map, the Earth's moon, uh, showing both the uh, near side and the, and the far side, all the, all the important craters at least, and a lot of detail on how the moon's orbit works and, uh, and just interesting, fascinating things about, about the moon. So things are now changing again. Um, we now have gone from these small refractors to small, um, I guess, reflectors and increased the size of the reflectors that when the Dobsonian era came out. Now we're going into postmodernism, which is what we're into right now. And I predict it's going to be a few more years before we go into the next phase. So what is postmodernism? Well, now you can really, really see details in nebula and many galaxies. Um, this is the era of CCD imaging, uh, large ref re reflectors. You know, it used to be a time in which if you saw a reflector larger than 12 inches, that would be really something. But that's kind of ho-hum now. A reflector larger than 24 inches, now that, that might get, get your attention. So things have really increased in size and capability, especially with the CCD imaging. Incredible stuff here for, for post in postmodernism, which we're, we're into well, we're, we're, we're into now, but we're going to be leaving it in shortly in a, in a, <clears throat> in a few years. So, imagine what we have access today. Um, we have, you know, just read down the list. We have lightweight travel scopes, solar scopes, uh, long focal length scopes, fast scopes, large aperture binoculars, astrographic scopes, and many others. I didn't even talk about um, uh, um, radio telescopes for amateurs but those, those are out there. You know, so we have everything that we want today. We have it. So we're in a pretty lucky spot. You know, one of the things that you, you hear about is that we're, we're living in the age or the golden age of amateur astronomy. And that's true, but that's always true because uh, astronomy is really a fairly fast changing field advancing. It's, it's not regressing at all. So each year, you're, if you're on the forefront of it, well, you're in the golden age. Um, we'll have to see how that turns out in a few years from now where we, where we head off for that. So today you go out and look, what do you use for a star atlases? Well, sky and telescopes, uh, pocket sky atlas is very popular. And it has a lot of the same detail that the uh, um, um, Skolnite uh, Atlas back in 1955 had but this is much more uh, suitable for amateurs today. You can get more information from various books, Stars and Planets. I'm sure you've all seen this one. Uh, this is one of my, my favorite books. Um, it's, it's more into history now for me. Uh, Burnham's Celestial Handbook. It's a three volume series. I, I have a friend who is a playwright and he's a pretty good play, playwright. And I've been trying to convince him to do a, to write a play about the, his, about the life history of Robert Burnham. Of course, it would be a tragedy, but there would be a lot of really interesting twists and turns along the way. One of these is, is, his, is, this, is this book here. You know, he, uh, when he signed this book deal, he had a, uh, a deal for, with uh, Dover Books 
and he'd get a certain amount of royalties. Well, Dover Books turned turn around and turned it into the Book of the Month Club. So selling it for a dime. So Robert Burnham got a very small percentage of that dime. And I feel kind of bad because that's how I got this. So he didn't get much, much royalty from this book at all. Sorry to say, but that's a classic. And also in, in this time of postmodernism, we have astronomy gatherings all over the place. Um, star parties, conferences, expositions, and so on, which we'll look at some of these. Uh, go to Neef, uh, Northeast Astronomy Forum. A lot of people have been to it. It's, I think it's the largest in the country. It's a gathering of, of astronomy vendors of all types from all over the country, selling all types of stuff. Obviously, here's Celestron. Now, here's something that's near and dear to Roberts. Um, <laughs> A lot of stuff there, you know, he, he's responsible <laughs> for, that's the signature trailer there. But, uh, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of people go to Neve, and this is where they meet, and greet people and do networking and buy and sell and all that. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. Teleview is there, all types of telescopes. Um, here's some larger Dobsonian telescopes. The smaller Dobsonian ones, you, you really wouldn't uh, take much notice at anymore because they're, they're getting pretty common. But the large one, you sure would. You go to these conferences, you see stuff like this. This is all pretty common. Eyepieces. Boy, uh, I'll, I'll talk about more about eyepieces in just a moment, but there are all types of, of pretty, pretty cool equipment out there. Uh, Explore scientific eyepieces included. Uh, the whole range of, of, of quality, uh, wide field, wide angle eyepieces. So what type of uh, books, guides do we have now? in our postmodern, into the postmodernism time. Uh, this is a nice one, Observing Handbook and Catalog of Deep Sky Optics, which is one of my favorite. I've always enjoyed looking at this. It gives you a pretty good breakdown of what's in the night nice sky and a good description of it. I'll we'll go through it all, of course. This is probably a big, a big seller, uh, the Night Sky Observer's Guide. I think it comes in three volumes. It contains just about everything. And it has detailed descriptions of both drawings, sketches, with uh, some photographs and some charts to help you find these things. So today, amateurs can find this stuff pretty easily. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was tough for people to find this stuff because you didn't know exactly where it was or you, uh, you didn't know what it would look like. So you had a hard time trying to understand what you're seeing in the eyepiece. We have CCD imaging. Now this whole talk could spend an hour in CCD imaging, but today, you know, we have these fantastic images, fantastic. Um, 20, 30 years ago, well, let's say 20 years ago, a lot of these just, just weren't there. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, now, uh, these images just, you see right here would beat out observatory photographs from, from 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Pretty incredible stuff that amateurs get, get today. Now, I'd like to mention something about advancements in accessories, and I just wanna talk about two, two types. You have the finder. You know, back then in the other eras, you had your uh, finder scope, which might be a, an eight by 30 or, or 10 by 50, which is what this finder is on the left-hand side. Um, and they were, they were useful, but boy, when, when the Telred came out, uh, so-called the, the, the reflex finder, red dot or unit finder, because it doesn't magnify anything. Uh, that was a real, real advance. It's so simple. It made finding things in the sky really easy or, or putting them in your eyepiece really easy. And the other thing that made it easy were the, was the ultra wide angle eyepieces, um, such as by uh, Nagler. Uh, they all have them now. Nagler, Mead, Explorer Scientific has a very, very nice, nice uh, array of those. They're, they, they've got great, great views. It makes things easier to find. Easy, it, it, it makes your enjoyment of the hobby so, so much more. That's what we have today. Now going into the future, I call it abstractism. Simply because we are entering a time of um, more remote automated observing. We're entering a time in which uh, um, uh, imaging will, will be taking a big hold. It, right now, imaging is pretty important in the hobby. Visual observing is, is still there, and it, 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 it might, may, may be the, the most uh, 
popular right now, but, but imaging is going to be increasing more and more. It's becoming easier to do. So let's go down to uh, abstractism. Really, it's now you're observing photons that don't really reach your eyes. Uh, you never see the stuff in person. It's always on a camera that could be in your backyard on your telescope, or it could be on a, some remote observatory. Um, speaking of remote observatories, um, we have commercial automated systems now, which you've probably all heard of, of the SLU system, um, eye telescope, inside observatory, and there, there must be plenty more in which you rent telescope time, and then you have that, that telescope uh, find the object and automatically image it for you. Or uh, you just download uh, uh, their own um, pre-obtained data and uh, manip manipulate it yourself to get an image and, and adjust the image the way you want. Something like this is, is, is just changing the hobby pretty fast, and I'm gonna tell you, tell you why in just a moment. A friend of mine uh, did this. He belongs to the club that I belong to, and he commonly takes pictures like this. This is from a telescope in, in New Mexico, but this system also has telescopes in, in Australia, uh, well, around, around the world. And for, I don't know, this might have been cost him 30 bucks for telescope time to, to get this image. Now, that's pretty incredible. You couldn't have done this 30 years ago. Another one of the Horsehead Nebula. Okay, uh, William Ida Fleming may be impressed with this, but you know that's what that's what people get get today. So what's, what's after abstract? The abstract ab abstractism, the abstract era. Well, I don't know, but I can make some guesses at what's going to be happening here. You know, we have uh, the, the future. It's truly an undiscovered country. For you Star Trek fans, you might recall what this is all about. It's from Shakespeare, Hamlet's to be or not to be sol uh, so soliloquy in which he is um, contemplating the meaning of death. Well, it could also be contemplating the future. Nobody knows what the future is. The only way you're gonna find out about the future is to go there. And that is where we're going. I have one more point, which I'd, I'd like to make and set, some, something to think about. Uh, over the next few years, I'm calling it the age of egalitarianism. What that really means is that finally, just about everybody who is interested can pursue an, uh, an active hobby of enjoying the night sky, of imaging the night skies, of experiencing the night skies. Now, why is that? Well, because because of remote observing. Just, just think about this, what remote observing does now. Light pollution is a big problem. Well, with remote observing, light pollution won't be a problem. Traveling to a suitable dark sky lo location won't be a problem either. Um, the weather, should, it shouldn't be a, a big deal at all. You don't have to buy expensive, sophisticated equipment. But I think what's, what's really gonna come up is, is, is this uh, fifth point. So societal attitudes towards women entering a man's field will not be as much of a factor as it has been. Anybody can, can do uh, imaging, uh, remote imaging. Anybody from any country, as long as they have the suitable internet and uh, computer capabilities, which is not that big of a deal anymore. Anybody can do this. And then maybe the most important thing, which I think a lot of people have felt at times is that they worry about the hazards of observing alone at a dark secluded location. At the bottom of this, uh, there's a picture of a, of a footprint that uh, my wife took about a month ago in the snow out, out front. Uh, we do have bears and one walked by. And I can tell you, I don't wanna be outside observing through my telescope when, the, when a bear is walking by. But uh, with remote observing, you won't really have, have that, that, that problem. Um, so with that, I, that really concludes what I have to say. And I, I want you to think about some of the stuff that I said, about how we have uh, progressed in um, amateur astronomy. Um, let's see if I can get off this. There we go. There I go. Okay. Um, 
you know, where, where we have progressed in amateur astronomy over the years. You know, we started out with these, these two, three inch refractors. We've gone to the larger um, four to six inch reflectors and a little bit of refractors. In came the SCTs, in came the Dubsonians, in came the CCD, in came uh, remote imaging. You know, this whole hobby has, has progressed where everything is changing. Right now, things are changing so rapidly. A lot of these times, a lot of these uh, era, eras which I was talking about were lasting 30, uh, 25 years, something like that. Well, things are happening so fast now, we're just like, talking like 15 years, 10 years down the road, it's hard to see what's, how things are really gonna be. But amateur astronomy is changing. It's a great, it's a great hobby. But I, I, know, I know people like, like Scott who are, who are on this because they, they, they see the products coming out every year, every day. Uh, they, they see the, the good stuff and the bad stuff that come out but it's all changing, it's all there. And the league has to change with it, and we are. As you know, we got the Williamina Fleming imaging program. Uh, we have another other imaging programs. We have, um, of course, the, all, all the temp different types of observing programs, which it's all about. But all this stuff is changing because the equipment is, is advancing incredibly fast. And you know, as you saw with some of these images, I didn't even show you the best images. The imaging is changing so fast that it's it's really uh, kind of kind of mind boggling in a way. Unless somebody has any questions, that that's pretty much what I have. And think of the future, and that that's where we're all going to be. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll let Scott look and see if there's any questions. Well, what I, what I hope that people will start thinking about what I said and, and, and how it all, all, all plays out in the hobby, how the past is affecting our, our present, and how our present is going to affect the future. Yeah. Yeah. You brought up some interesting points. Um, you know, and it was really nice to look back because my very first telescope was a six inch RV uh, ref reflector. Mm -hmm. And actually, I ended up buying it from some used from somebody that eventually within about six years joined a club I was in and he looked at me and said, you bought my telescope. And I said, <laughs> yeah, I did buy it. I still have, and I still have it. It's like you said, you kind of hang on to something like that. And when you showed the pictures, my very first picture through that telescope was of the moon. And I'll never forget it was six below that night. And I couldn't wait to put a camera on that telescope. And I drug it out in the garage and I had, so that way the wind wasn't hitting me. And I took my first picture of the moon with that. And, yeah. you know, for that, at that time, I was extremely happy with what I had, you know, so it, it's interesting to go back and look at this because I'm sure everybody Maynard and, you know, the scopes that he's got and Carol and Molly Scott, I mean, my gosh, everything that we've all worked with, you covered a lot of what every one of us probably at one time or another has worked with. Yeah, John, uh, as you mentioned, I, I have a lot of those telescopes. The Unitron kind of wore out. They had the old wooden tripod. The Questar is as new today as it was, and I've carried it all over the country and other countries as well. It's so portable, but it, it stays in good shape. And I was redoing my will recently to update it. And uh, so I was... Uh, uh, saying who gets my different telescopes. And it occurred to me that uh, my grandson will get most of my telescopes and he'll look at them as obsolete. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, if, if he's going into imaging, yeah, a lot of this stuff will be obsolete. Yeah. But the visual observers will always be out there. They will always want to go yeah. under the stars with oh, their yeah. own eyes and look up and have a good time. So... That's right. There's, there's right. nothing like an eye to the eyepiece. Yeah, everybody that sees a telescope wants to put their eye to the eyepiece and actually see the photons coming through it. So even me, yeah, I, 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 I do kind of laugh. Imager, but, <laughs> still like yeah. to look at look through telescopes. <laughs> well, yeah, you know when you're between images, uh, you can always have that second scope and actually see see what it really looks like. Yeah. Fourth or fifth, but yes. <laughs> Third or fourth or fifth or tenth or twentieth. <laughs> But you uh, go look through other people's scopes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There were there were some comments here that are worth uh, uh, mentioning here. I, I don't know if I'll get everyone here, but uh, um, 
Uh, Jeff Wise, who I know has a lot of telescopes, was uh, <laughs> remarking about his, getting his first giant magnet from Edmund Scientific. So I think that showing some of the ads and stuff made yeah. people nostalgic, you know, for what it was, you know, if, if you're if you've been into it for that long. Uh, uh, well, but, I, I, uh, I'd like to inter interject there with I, too, got a giant magnet from Edmund Scientific. And that was because I was playing playing with the pinball machines and I wanted to grab that ball <laughs> with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay so um but uh jeff said that he is getting a prima lucci um uh i guess he's getting a radio telescope or or is thinking about it anyways uh he's got so many telescopes in his yard that uh he's gonna have trouble fitting it in though um uh the uh what a and problem to have <laughs> <laughs> that's right uh, people were talking, you showed, uh, you talked a little bit about some of the events and stuff that people could go to and, um, uh, uh, you know, the advanced imaging conference kind of is one that, uh, really is, uh, indicative of how important imaging now is to, uh, the lifestyle of astronomy, you know, so, um, uh, you know, so it, there's, uh, there you know, are people a lot of know that, uh, go ahead. Oh, there are a lot of conferences every year now. If, if you look back in the magazines from the 1970s, you'll see just a handful, including the Astronomical League Convention was one of them. But today, you know, you can go to a conference every weekend from May through October or maybe even April through October. You know, there's always something all over the country. So it's, they aren't that rare anymore. Amateurs like, like to get together and, uh, you know, kick the tires of different telescopes, so to speak. That's right. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, Norm Hughes wants to thank all of you for a, a great presentation. Um, uh, people were remarking uh, the miracle of uh, plate solving. Okay. That is, uh, that is an amazing, uh, uh, you know, feature that is now sometimes available, I guess, largely for free, you know, this amazing technology. So yeah, you think I mean, about all the, the multi-million dollar technology that just got turned over to uh, amateur astronomy, you know, over the years, it's really incredible. So I don't even, I don't even align my mounts anymore. I just get on polar aligned and then I let plate solving get me on target. Like, yeah, what better way to do that? You know? <laughs> it's, it's easier than standing out in the cold and aligning it. <laughs> right. That is right. Yeah. Um, but uh, we had a great audience today and um, uh, lots of interesting comments all, all along the way there. Uh, incredible. Terry, you, do, you always do a great job in putting together a very, very interesting group of people. Um, you know, I'm not going to include myself in that because I'm just <laughs> connecting the wires here. But, you know, it is it is a lot of fun to watch it go down. So, uh, you know, that's very cool. Thank and you. John, you did an awesome job. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. Well, you know, it, I'll tell you, it, it's hard to miss when you go down memory lane. Because, you know, you're looking at Terry. She's nodding her head. And Maynard's nodding his head when, when we're talking about the the... The, the Astrola telescopes and the RV6 or, or the yep. C8 and, and all that, you know, we all remember all that stuff and we still have it, at least a lot of it. But yeah, uh, I still have my Norton Sky Atlas. Uh, it, it's yeah. almost a complete uh, uh, <laughs> book. Yeah, I got it right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, at, at least your binding is intact. <laughs> And to show you how far imaging has gone, I, I still, I still, <laughs> I keep a eight by 10 inch plate from Mount Wilson Observatory of the moon. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, wow. Plate. Yeah. And that was, yeah, through the hundred inch. So oh, that is, okay. I mean, this stuff, you know, this is dated 1924. This stuff doesn't, uh, doesn't fade I away. I mean, it's just one. incredible, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. And I have my old star charts, of course, and uh, glass and optics and uh, telescope gear in general uh, can keep going on generation after generation if it's cared for. So, 
Yeah. But I exactly. think it's, also, it's something to keep in mind, though, about what I was calling the uh, egalitarian nature of our hobby, at least what we're going into. Because with imaging, anybody can do it. And um, you, well, who has internet? Um, and I can see a lot more people just jumping into it. And half those people who jump into it are going to be women. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we should see a, a lot more females in our hobby. Um, I guess that's a good and we thing. do. We actually do. And it's, so it's, it's certainly the fastest growing part of our community. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, great. All right. Yeah. Good job. Yes. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate that. That was really interesting. So, all right, let's go back and I am going to give the answers to the questions. Oops. Um, I got to listening to John's talk and almost did not get that done. All of a sudden I realized he was wrapping up and I still had some work to do. All right. Oops. I have to put a shot in between my PowerPoint so I don't accidentally go ahead and show the answers when I, I right after I ask the questions. So here's the answers for tonight. Uh, Fleming hired 20 women. Hmm. And Norm Hughes is the winner of a travel mug. And everyone got this right. The belief that everything is changing. That's what that statement means. No man ever steps into the same river twice. Every moment is unique. And I think we can all agree with that. And Jason Wallace has won a travel mug. All right. Yes. And my fingers were crossed. Hopefully everybody else's is too. Uh, the name of the comic that hopefully at least we can image if we can't see it naked eye at least get some images of it at the end of April beginning of May is C202103 Pan Stars and Michael Overracker will be traveling with a new travel mug. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to thank everybody Scott Roberts CEO and founder of Explore Scientific and broadcast genius there. You know, you might not say it about yourself. <laughs> Once you get enough hours that. of practice, you become an expert. And <laughs> Scott broadcasts like 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's right. <laughs> yeah, right, yes. Oh. And <laughs> David Levy, we, our, our poet and our, and our author, Carol Org, the Astronomical League president. And I was gonna, you know, there were so many things I could say about Carol. I thought he does it all. You know, he's right now he is president and keeping all of, all of us in line. And that is a big job. We have our days. <laughs> Maynard Pittendre. And again, Maynard, you're not the observe program. One of the observe program directors. Uh, let me try this. You're the executive secretary of the Astronomical League. But say you are the observing what? <laughs> What's your title? Oh, you're muted. It's one of the directors. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Observe. Yeah. Okay, so he is one of the directors. John, our media author, uh, officer. He is also our lunar lunatic, which I have not forgotten from the Halloween party. Oh my and gosh! The past, <laughs> past president of the Astronomical League, and Molly. Molly Wakeling, I've known for a few years now, Astro Imager speaker, all around good, good girl. <laughs> she knows all kinds of stuff. She's one of those that you can talk to, ask questions, and she is always willing to help, uh, helping more women, helping more people into the hobby. Mm -hmm. So thank you all. I appreciate well, Terry, everybody being here. Terry, you, you, you forgot somebody. Who's that? Terry Mann. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to do like Scott does. <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to, you know, leave that one out there too. <laughs> but thank no, you, No, Jack. no, no, you, you, you certainly deserve credit. Uh, you're, a, you're a past president of the Astronomical League. You're a current, current secretary. Uh, you've been involved in this and many uh, aspects in amateur astronomy and popularizing it in, in the Great Lakes region. Um, are you still the chair? You were the chair of the Great Lakes. Yeah, um, I still am. You still am. So you you've been in this IDA work, work with dark skies, uh, work with youth. Uh, you, you've been involved in this hobby ever since I've known you. Ever since I've known in you. addition, she was co-chair of uh, the uh, 
Alcon 2021 live online. And she and Chuck did a fabulous job. Thanks to Chuck, uh, Scott for helping well with that as well. But they, we, they did a fabulous job. It, it, and it wasn't an easy job. It's something that had to be done. I mean, if you made a mistake, you know, you had 2,000 people know it immediately. So, you know, you had to make sure things were going right. And, and Terry, speaking, and Chuck did speaking of change, blazing a new trail there. Yeah. That, that's true. Well, thank you. Thank you all for those kind compliments. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, but you know, uh, Astronomic or AL, the Alcon virtual was a whole new thing. Yeah, definitely part of the change. Uh, and uh, what we'll see is part of a change again this year at Albuquerque. We will be trying to figure out how to broadcast part of the Ast of Alcon. Uh, we don't, you know, we have to work with Scott and see exactly how we're going to do that. But more change, you know, and it's like John said, we have to keep up, you know, and the league does keep up. We have a lot of members and we want to try, try to help them as much as we can. And so that's something we all work at. Everybody on this program is a fantastic support of amateur astronomy. So thank you all again. And as you will see, I thought, there it went, <laughs> um, Mike Shaw will be our speaker on March 11th for uh, Astronomical League Live. He is an amazing photographer. And so we look forward to having him here on this show on March 11th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And Scott? Jerry or Jerry Hubble. <laughs> Am I blasting off? <laughs> <laughs> My phone is, sorry. <laughs> That's okay, yes. you know, yeah, whatever. It's my ringtone, uh, so. If anybody else has anything they else they'd like to add, say, please jump in right now. I see Molly showing her cat. <laughs> There's Apollo. He's he's joined us tonight. And Orion, who is a super oh, <laughs> He cute. finally gave up his quest for food and settled onto my lap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. And Scott, I think I will turn that over to you if you can, if I can. No. Okay, there we go. All right. I think that'll, that'll wrap it up then. That'll thank wrap it up much, as Jerry. far as we go. All right. Take care. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, everybody. everybody. Uh, thank, thank you for you. joining us. Not yeah. everybody. Good night, everyone. Night. Take care. Thank you.